One close look at the world today, and even the most ardent skeptic admits that time is drawing near. The world's supernatural clockmaker offers us signposts that can be seen for those that are willing to seek them in earnest. Join us now as we document signs from the Lord, from His creation, as recorded in Genesis 1, right up until modern-day historical records leading to 2021. Why? Because the time is near. I am Mark Russick, and you are listening to The Russick Outlook. As always, just my opinion. Hello and good day, everybody. Hi, this is Mark Russick. You're listening to The Russick Outlook. Thanks for joining us. Today's subject, what time is it now? Creation to 2021. I was so tempted to open this broadcast up with uh, a song by the band Chicago. Uh, the name of it is, Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? However, if I did that, I was afraid I might be dating myself. Uh, I, I, I love Chicago. It's a great band. It's a great song, a great horn arrangement. Um, and, and it would have been apropos to open up with that. But again, I don't know how many people would have gotten it. Um, Perhaps you can let me know. But at any rate, I, I wanted to talk about this, and this is really a continuation from the prior broadcast where I broke down the uh, seven days of creation and how each millennium that pertain to uh, each day, meaning day one would be t- pertain to the first millennium, day two to the second. And I laid out how prophetically everything was fulfilled just as God had laid out everything through the first six days. And then the seventh day would be the day of rest, uh, which will be the uh, millennium, which will be the seven one thousandth year, uh, the final millennium uh, on the earth as we know it, um, as, as we will know it. It's, even in the millennium, we're not going to. Everything's going to be changed, complete makeover. But that's for a different subject. At any rate, what I wanted to do uh, is, is kind of lay out in a prophetic timeline as well as uh, a historical timeline things that you can see, things that matter in the Bible and things that we can kind of point to as uh, significant historical uh, events that happened around the world, and many of them uh, of which are written about in the Bible. Um, You know, for those who say, well, the Bible is inaccurate or, you know, it doesn't point to it you know, anything in particular, and and that's just not true. There's a lot of history in the Bible that has been borne out by historians, archaeologists, etc. So we'll be seeing some of that. I want to lay that out. Um, And I just think it'll help you uh, from a visual standpoint. If you can see this laid out, it's it's very linear um, where you can kind of see things. I'm going to lay it out from the sequence of events, beginning with Adam and Eve and creation, um, and ending in up to modern day where we are uh, in, in 2021. Uh, so I, I have a favor to ask, please, if you could hit the like and the subscribe button, um, and, and as well as if you can ring the bell uh, for us on, on YouTube and the other platforms, hitting the like and subscribe really helps us get into the various algorithms, gets us to moving up to the top of, of the list And why? Because we're trying to get the information into people's hands so that ultimately they can make their decisions, whether they know Jesus or not. Um, It's really twofold. My heart is to present information that can be um, verified not only within the Bible, but also outside of the Bible. Uh, For those who may be skeptics or sitting on the fence or not sure what they believe or they think they believe, uh, and, and others who, who are Christians and maybe, and, and I'm sure at times, I know at times that we're going to be passing along information that can help you uh, perhaps grow or perhaps you can share with somebody in, within your sphere of influence. So that's really what I, what my heart is and what I'm about. So what I'm going to lay out here is, is uh, a lot of history um, and, and it's going to be helpful in the sense of we're going to see where we are today in God's calendar. Uh, so, you know, if, if I could, I'd be closing with the, with, with the music from Chicago, but I think you get the point. This is really, uh, an, an important topic because it's lining up with God's calendar. God has a very prophetic timeline. Uh, it's, it's within his constraints and, and we'll see that as we lay this out now. So I, I, I will say if, if you are listening to me on podcast right now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
if you can, if you can get a chance to look us uh, up on video on either Russick Outlook or YouTube. We have the YouTube channel there. Uh, it's it'll help you. I'm going to explain things and I'll, I'll, I'll articulate knowing that I have podcast listeners here. Um, but again, if you can kind of see it, uh, it, it really helps. I'm starting with creation as, as we know it from 4004 B.C., a lot of these dates and times I'm going to uh, pick up from Asher. He's considered uh, the, the quintessential authority, and I'm not going to get into all the breakdowns of, uh, of why 4004. We're just going to go there. And for a lot of these dates, I'll just t- say it up front. You know, it, it's, it's within generally a couple of years. It could be a couple of decades. It could be within 100 years. Um, but, but other than that, it's very, very accurate. Uh, and, and there are times here where you'll see it's absolutely spot on. And we know that because of a lot of the historical evidence. So at any rate, I'm starting with creation in 4004 BC. And if you're looking from top left, I'm moving to the right. And there I go. Uh, the, the, the next subject is sin. We know where Adam and Eve committed sin. And then in Genesis 3.15, where I call this, where Yahweh, the father, pronounces his death sentence. And it reads, and I'm, I'm going to read from the Amplified here, and, it, it, and it's right below it. And it says, I will put enmity, also open hostility, is, is, is the meaning in the Amplified or the translation, between you and the woman and between your seed, your offspring, and her seed. So he's separating the seeds there. He's separating the offspring, the generations to come. He shall freely bruise your head and you shall only bruise his heel. Very famous scripture. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with that. Then it goes to the Nephilim in uh, Genesis 6, 4. These are the sons of God, the fallen angels who had uh, intercourse with women and they produce what is called the Nephilim, uh, which are the, the giants of old, the giants of renown. We've covered that in recent broadcasts. Uh, you can reference this in Genesis 6, 4, and, and there's evidence all over the world of, of these giants, not only in their skeletal remains, but you know we've, we've gone through some of the megalithic structures and the, uh, the detailed architecture and, and techniques that were used that could not have possibly been used of human understanding thousands of years ago. So I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, belabor points, but I just want to, you know, kind of bring people up to speed. Next, I I am pointing out, uh, or or I should say that this happened roughly 500 years uh, after creation, and then approximately around that time, the War of the Nephilim happened as according to the book of Enoch. So I am not saying that that's scriptural. I pointed this out when I looked into the Nephilim, looked into the evidence, But that would date this time to around 3050 B.C., which would have been the time that the fallen angels were sentenced to Tartarus that committed these sins. Uh, Moving on to Noah and the building of the ark and the flood happening in 2348 B.C. And then 1912 B.C., you have Abraham arriving on the scene. So that kind of brings you to from from uh, Adam to Abraham, the first 2000 years. And next, I I wanted to point this out that in 1700 BC, we have discovered uh, some ancient tablets that have written accounts um, from Samaria and Iraq and southern what would be Babylon um, of the global flood. Yes, there was a global flood that was written about before Moses penned Genesis. So I, I find this of immense importance because so many people, they they, uh, poo-poo the idea of a global flood, even though we have hundreds of accounts of it from ancient civilizations all around the world, outside of the Bible. I've covered this before as well. Um, But this is had to have been written at the minimum 250 years before um, uh, 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 Moses had written the book of Genesis. So here you have you know, I just got, I, I wanted to point that out because I find that of, of immense significance. Um, and where I, then you have the parting of the Red Sea, where we know that Moses led the Jewish people uh, starting their journey into the promised land. And then I say shortly thereafter, he pens the Pentateuch, which is the book of Genesis and the ensuing four books afterwards. Uh, 1407, Joshua leads the Jews into the promised land. Uh, David arrives on the scene as a young boy, defeating Goliath in 974 B.C. 
then you have uh, the first major empire. So you have the first, you had the uh, Egyptian empire, then you had the Assyrian, and then the Babylonian. And the Babylonian empire is of great biblical significance because uh, they crushed Israel and took Israel with them uh, into captivity in, in Babylon and written about, you know, m mostly and, and most famously in the book of Daniel, how Daniel had served King Nebuchadnezzar and, and others in the royal court. Um, but that's a big significance. And again, that's written about in all of your history books, as well as it's covered in the Bible, backing up the same dates and times, as well as the following empire, which was the Medo-Persian uh, Medo Empire, um, Cyrus the Great. So, you know, here you have that in 539 B.C., and then I'm going to move, and, and again, you know, written about in history, just as it is in the Bible. So the Bible wrote about it, and all of your textbooks outside of the Bible wrote about it. Then you have something that is of great significance, and I just wanted to um, uh, pause right here. And if you're following me on video, you see this timeline, because this is written about in the book of Daniel. Uh, this is, has to do with the 70 weeks of seven I covered in the previous broadcast the significance that God counts time in sevens, and here we're talking about a preordained period of time of 70 weeks of years, or 490 years, in which case, um, uh, uh, 400, uh, I, I should say, yeah, 483 of those years have already been accounted for and, and uh, been documented, and then the remaining seven years comes at the end of time in the uh, tribulation, which is written about in the book of Revelation. The reason I'm, I'm pausing here for, for a moment is Daniel's prophecy is undeniable, empirical, measurable, provable evidence of the proof of God, of the proof of the truth of God. Uh, th this has been written about and documented, and we have outside sources that we know that uh, according to this, and I, I'm not going to go into detail, I've covered this before, uh, but Daniel 9, 24 through 25, he goes into saying that this, this will be this uh, period of time where from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there will be seven years, seven, seven times seven, and we know that that happened because uh, Azerches gave that decree in, on, and specifically on the date of March 14th, 445 B.C., and it was completed in 396 B.C., uh, 7 times 7, 49 years later, and then the 50th year it was completion. And I just point out here that that is the year of uh, a jubilee. There was a jubilee. It was a 50th year, and we'll cover that a little bit uh, more in depth shortly. Um, but I just, if you can jump to the right and follow the red circle on the bottom, if you go to April 6th, 32 AD, we know that that was the day that Jesus uh, arrived in Jerusalem riding on the donkey, what's famously known in many churches and in, in different Catholic and, and uh, Christian churches as Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem riding on a mule or a cult, and, and, and they laid the palms down and singing Hosanna, recognizing him as the King of Kings, as the Lord, the Messiah. We know that these dates happen. If you measure the timeline, and we do this according to 360-day uh, uh, day years, which is the Hebrew calendar, which is the lunar calendar, which is also the Muslim calendar, uh, that comes out to exactly uh, uh, 173,880 days, which is uh, 483 years. And, and I've given you some of the math here. It accounted for some leap years. Uh, but but it laid it da laid it out exactly, um, uh, you know, just as as the Lord said it would that there would be um, from from this point on once Jerusalem uh, w was commissioned to be restored until the uh, the prince it says uh, the Messiah King would arrive in Jerusalem. That's exactly what it is, and you can go into that. Uh, I did a, um, a study in Daniel. If you want to look that up, I I kind of really broke that down a lot more. But I, I just wanted to pause there for a second. This is, you know, you, you, you cannot deny the Bible after looking at this. You just, well, some people can, but I, I, I just don't see it. But let me move on. Uh, so 396 B.C., Jerusalem was rebuilt just as, as was prophesied in the Bible. 
Then you have the Greek Empire in 323 B.C. In 180 B.C., the Old Testament was canonized. Uh, so, you know, that's where you have all of your Old Testament books that you read today or that you recognize or see in the Bible today. Uh, they, they were accepted in 180 B.C. as passing the litmus test as being Holy Spirit inspired. I move on to 63 B.C. That's when the Roman Empire conquers Jerusalem. Um, this is shortly before the birth of our Savior, and it lines up with exactly uh, historically because we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and obviously, you know, all of his accounts in the city of Jerusalem, particularly that last week, is, is written about. What I do point out here, there is the uh, chapter 3 of Luke has the genealogy of Adam to Jesus. And if you lay it out, it's exactly 4,000 years, just as the Bible says it is. So, that you know, there you have that. So around 1 BC, we're saying, is the birth of Jesus. 32 AD, we know he rode into Jerusalem. So about a week later, uh, well, it would be a week later, uh, is when he was crucified. But let, let me just pause for a second. You see the scripture up above. It says, uh, I'm reading Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. What I'd like to point out here is the fullness of time had come according to the Lord. So the Lord designates pockets of time, and this is what he said would happen in Genesis 3. And sure enough, some 4,000 years later, it comes to pass. So uh, this is the fullness of time. But what I wanted to point out, too, is how things will then speed up in the fullness of time once this happens. If, if you think about Jesus... Um, his his life is 30 years old before his uh, mission to, to take on uh, uh, his his calling, um, his his uh, his vision, his purpose for what he was put down here in, in terms of those final three years. So from 30 to 33, that then you have the ministry of Jesus, I'll call it, uh, which culminates at the crucifixion, and which is on the Passover. We know that historically; that's been verified. Then, which translates to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to the Feast of uh, First Fruits when he is resurrected. And then some 50 days later is the Feast of Pentecost, uh, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we know about that from Acts. So all of this happened exactly as was prophesied, exactly as was laid out in, in the Old Testament. And these are the dates. So I'm just trying to you know, give you a, a historical timeline um, a, a validity to, to to Jesus, and then once Holy Spirit came, Pentecost came. Then you had the birth of the church. So what I'm calling the birth of the church age, beginning at 33 A.D. So I've I've kind of laid this all out to what will be the start of the church age, and then I'm going to keep moving now. So if you go to 70 AD, we know about the siege of Jerusalem. And just as Jesus had prophesied when he told the apostles that, that this temple would fall, no stone would lie upon another. You can go to Jerusalem today. You can see that evidence there today. Uh, I, I've been there and I just, you know, I looked at it. I, I just marveled. Um, but anyway, that's in 70 AD. And that's when uh, Jerusalem was again destroyed and the scattering of the Jews throughout the land, just as exactly as prophesied would happen, uh, you know, happened, and then the calling back, uh, which, which we'll see very shortly. So jumping up about uh, another little over 320 years or so to 397 AD, the 27 New Testament uh, uh, books are canonized. So again, they've passed the litmus test. They're believed to be Holy Spirit inspired, and they then join the canonization books of the Old Testament. So that's really where you get the, the Bible in its completion at this time at 397 BC, AD. Excuse me. Uh, I, I marked here the birth of Islam in 700 AD. Well, why? What does that have to do with the Bible? Well, this is the enemy of, of, of the Jews today as we know it, and we know that this is a false religion. I mean, no disrespect to anybody if you're listening and you're a Muslim. Uh, I, but I'm just bearing out what the evidence shows us, and I'll be happy to uh, uh, in, engage in that, you know, if you will. 
um, and I will be doing a, 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 a broadcast or two on that, laying out the clear distinctions between the Muslim religion and, and uh, the life of Christ and, and, and the Christian Bible, and the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament Bible, I should say. Um, but I, I did think that of, of immense significance. And I'll also just point out that so much of uh, Islam is trying or is mimicking in one form or distorted form uh, uh, of the Bible. And it happened 700 years after Jesus. So I fast forward another 700 plus years to the Bible's first printing, uh, which is the Gutenberg uh, Press. So I, I find that of Im immense significance because this is when not only are you printing it, but now you're printing it and you're translating it in various languages. So that's really where there was a big push to get the Bible going around the world so that people uh, can read it in their own native language. I'm jumping to 1492 and 1493 for a couple of reasons. Uh, I am somewhat biased as an American, but I do feel America has been blessed by God, has a very big role, and has had a big role to play in the world. And I believe the blessings that come upon America uh, are, are steeped in our foundation, our, our Christian roots, and, and you know I'll cover that again shortly, and, and I have... Uh, done some uh, research on that. The Wall Builders is a wonderful ministry by David Barton, who covers that immensely. But at any rate, uh, we were built, starting with the Pilgrims and on to the Founding Fathers and then into the Revolutionary War on Christian principles. And this is the year that America was discovered by Columbus. But what I also wanted to point out here is at this same time, uh, right afterwards, you had your first uh, quadrant of uh, four blood moons that happened between 1492 and 1493, and we've we've covered this before. But you know, these are four eclipses that happen uh, within a two-year period, and they've and I'm pointing them out because they always always fall on Jewish holidays, on on the Jewish feast. So Genesis says that uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars are there for seasons and for signs. And you, you, know, you can look that up. And I believe this is a sign that God gives. So as America is discovered, and I'm just pointing it out that these are the dates, I'm not saying that that's, that is the case, but it's, it, it bears witness to me. I'll just put it that way. And then you had those four blood moons. Now you're going to jump over to 1517, where the Ottoman Empire conquers Palestine. So the, the Jewish people have been scattered. They're all over the world. They're, they're being scattered. And, and, and that, that land at this point, um, a, after the Roman Empire, is called Palestine. It's referred to that way. It's basically, it's a country of, of Bedouins. And, um, and I'm going to show you in a second exactly uh, what, what that land looked like beforehand. I want to pause here, and if you're following me on video, you see a number of blue arrows going to some different timelines, and I'm going to explain this to you, but I believe that that first timeline from 1517 to 1867, which is uh, that, that 350 years, seven jubilees, seven times seven, jubilee is 50 years, um, that that is really where... I believe the, the timeline, God's watch, really starts to kick in gear. I know a lot of it points to 1948 when the Jewish people, uh, w w when the land was discovered, and not discovered, I'm sorry, when the land was decreed uh, its own independent nation. But I believe it began in 1867, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, this really sticks out to me. So you've got that 350 years from the Ottoman Empire, uh, Right, right, right up until 1867, when what happens? And if you're following me on video, I'm showing you Mark Twain and Charles Warren, which I'm calling the Stranger and the Surveyor. And I'm referencing Deuteronomy 29, 22 through 23, and Zechariah 2, 5 through 6 for each one of them uh, accordingly. So bear with me for a second, because I believe, and this is my personal opinion as well as I know some others. Uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn is, is, has done some great research on this, if you're familiar with him. Um, and, and this is where I was able to get some of the information from, as well as some other sources. Uh, but but I, I just bear with me for a second. I want to pause here. I want to show you some things that I personally believe 
you know, are of such, such immense significance. And I believe it shows that somebody who you don't know that God would use uh, much to our surprise. So I'm going to come back to the calendar in a second. Mark Twain, for you know, most people know, is the father of American literature. He took a trip to Israel uh, in 1867, and it's uh, been, been well documented. But in it, he, he wrote about his vision. He wrote about the things that he was seeing, the things that he was watching. And strangely enough, uh, he, was, he was writing for a paper in San Francisco. He was bringing that information back to them. Uh, but what it turned out to be was his greatest and most popular book to this day. And it's called Innocence Abroad, uh, The New Pilgrim's Pro- Progress. Uh, it is his number one best-selling book. It's really well worth the read. Um, but in it, he writes about his journey and his times here. So pause, let me pause for a second. Deuteronomy 29, 22 through 23, I'm reading the Hebrew translation. And the generation to come, your children that shall rise up after you, and the foreigner, if you break this down, it's nakri in, in, in Hebrew, means singular, it's the stranger, that shall come from a far land, he shall bear witness, and or he shall say, which also means in Hebrew to bear witness, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness wherein the Lord has made it sick. So Deuteronomy is saying there will be a stranger that will come and he will testify to the sickness and the disease of this land that the, la- that the Lord made sick. And then it goes on to say, And the whole land therefore is brimstone and salt and a burning that is not sown, nor bears, nor any grass grows, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Adma and Zobalim, which the Lord overthrew in his lang- anger and in his wrath. So he's, he's, he's telling you that this person shall come that will set things in motion. It will be a stranger. I believe the stranger is Mark Twain. And I'm going to show you a little bit more uh, why. I'm going to just kind of highlight some things here. What I'm, what I'm saying was written in the Bible, and then what, when we, where you see the word or the initials MT stands for Mark Twain, things that he wrote. So the Bible says it'll be a whole land of brimstone and salt. Twain writes, it's all desolate and unpeopled, miles of desolate country, far-reaching desolation, the waste of a limitless des- desolation. The Bible also says it's a land of burning waste. The New tra- Living Translation says your land has become a scorching desert. Twain writes, it is a scorching, arid, repulsive solitude, such roasting heat, such oppressive solitude, dismal desolation. You can't, surely, uh, it it doesn't exist anywhere on earth like this. The Bible calls it a land that is unsown. Twain writes, one may ride 10 miles and not see any human beings. These unpeopled deserts, these rusty mounds of barrenness that never, never, never do shake the glare from their harsh outlines. Uh, you see, you know, it's a picture. He's in the desert. He's seeing it. You know that when you're, you know, you're in that 90 to 100 plus degree and you see that, 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 those harsh outlines. So he's describing this exactly as the Bible does. Uh, the Bible goes on to say, nor does it bear any life. Twain writes, the valleys are unsightly deserts fringed with feeble vegetation, a desert paved with loose stones, void of vegetation, glaring in the fierce sun this blistering, naked, treeless land. No sprig of grass is visible. So, you know, and, and it goes on and on. The, uh, the Bible also says the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring it upon every curse that is written in this book. Twain writes, Palestine six, sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse. Palestine is desolate and unlovely. Should, why should it be otherwise? Can the curse deity beautify a land. So I, I, I firmly believe with all my heart that the evidence, and there's more, if you wanted to research it and you wanted to read the book, you'll see it and, and you compare to what, what God wrote in the Bible. I believe that Mark Twain is that stranger. And I'm going to give you even more reason in a second. Okay, so as I said, I, I, I think this is going to present even more overwhelming evidence that even the most ardent skeptic can't, can't deny. There's something called the parasha, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct, which is a weekly text that's pre-selected from the Torah that is read in the synagogues on uh, each Sabbath. So 
on the Sabbath or the Saturday, September 28th, 1867, we know was the day that Mark Twain left Israel. That was his last day in Jerusalem uh, and, and the nation of Israel or Palestine as, as it was called then. So, and we can uh, go back and find out, okay, what was the text that was read in the synagogues that day? And sure enough, it was Deuteronomy 29, 22, 22 through 23, the exact verses that Twain would observe uh, concerning the, the, the curses and, and everything that we, we, we've just covered. That was the scripture that was read. Of all the scriptures that could have possibly been read, that was the one that was chosen for that day as Twain completed his work and wrote all of that information and eventually compiled it into the book we're talking about, but also sending that off to his publisher in San Francisco. So, you know, you, you, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's so rich and so vast and so deep. And, you know, it just points to the fact that God will use anybody, you know, and, and you see that throughout the Bible. Um, I, just a couple of small things here that I think is worth mentioning. Twain's real name is Samuel Clemens. Samuel in Hebrew means, means God has heard. Clemens is a Latin name, which means merciful. So God has heard merciful. Um, I'm going to read something that kind of solidifies all of this uh, as far as the Israel and, and, and what, what was going on at the time and what then the changes that are to come. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 3. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, wherever your Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you this day, then the Lord will God will restore your fortunes, have compassion on you, and gather you again from the nations where he scattered you. So this is why I'm saying this to me was the beginning of, of a very important period. Uh, this is... That, you know, I mean, I mean, it's undeniable because this is really where the, the start of the gathering of the people were coming in. We just saw from Twain that it was a desolate nation. No one was there. But right after this, then all of the people supernaturally were called and drawn from all the nations of the earth where they were. The Hebrews came back and, and forged the, this new land to the point where it's blooming as a, 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 as a flower in the desert. Uh, make no mistake about it. So... That's one part. Then I want to shift gears for a second and talk about Charles Warren, who was in Israel, in Jerusalem, the exact same time, the exact day that Twain left. Warren was there measuring the city as part of uh, the, the royal engineers for the, for the British army. Uh, Zechariah 2, verses 5 through 6, according to the Hebrew translation. I lift up mine eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Where thou goest? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. So the city is going to be measured. What is Warren doing there as part of the royal engineers? He has been commissioned to measure Jerusalem, including the old city, the underground cisterns, the ta uh, the the. The, the tunnels and the and and every and everything laid out in Jerusalem. He was charged to measure it as part of the transition, what was coming out of the Ottoman Empire and eventually into the hands of the British, who would then hand it off as part of the uh, Balfour Accord in 1917. So sure enough, just at this time, uh, he sees this, but he sees as a believer. He sees what Twain sees as an unbeliever. So. He sees the, 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 the oppressive heat, the curses of the land. He sees the Bedouins, uh, you know, everything that Twain sees for the most part. He, he is witness to, but he sees it in a different light. He sees it as their time is coming. And I, I, I'm assuming this, that he felt a calling that this was part of what he needed to do because he went home and he wrote the vision called The Land of Promise. He knew the prophecies. He knew what was to come. He knew uh, uh, that, that, that the Hebrews would be called back from, from the ends of the earth. So, you know, the fact that he and Twain were there at the same time, 
I personally believe that these two scriptures were fulfilled in this era, and it was the beginning and the kickoff for what was to come in this next hundred years, uh, um, or I should say 150 years plus. Yeah, about a, a little over 150 years. Um, so at, at any rate, I wanted to lay this out for you. I, I just, I found it fascinating. Um, and, and this is my opinion. And, you know, there are other ministers, uh, you know, that, that feel this way and, uh, you know, have, have sifted through this. And um, Jonathan Kahn is, is, is at the forefront. I believe the book was, I saw this in The Oracle. Um, but at, at, at any rate, you know, I, you, you can't you can't make this stuff up. It's just, it's incredible to the vastness and the richness of God's calendar and God's timing. So I'm going to wind it up here because there's so much more to cover and, and there's just not enough time. So we're going to cover the next 100 years or so, uh, or 150 years, uh, af after uh, the Balfour Accord, because this is, this is what's going to happen between this time that we just witnessed to 1917, which was another 50 years, the Jubilee. Uh, but at any rate, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I, I'm always grateful for your time and your attention. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, prayer requests, I'm, I'm good with everything. Email me at russicoutlook at gmail.com. Thanks again for your time. Hope to see you in the next broadcast where we're going to wind this down and bring this right up until 2021. June of 2021 is where we're going to right up until this day. So uh, I, again, I hope to see you then. Uh, this is Mark Russick. You've been listening to the Russick Outlook. As always. Just my opinion.